Let me turn to M. Cotton-Lem. Que pouvez-vous nous dire, monsieur? Thank you and good morning. Uh, I cannot tell you if we need a new order if, or if we can tweak the existing order, but I can tell you what I want in it. And I'd like to make this morning two very concrete proposals that I think uh, can contribute to the common good. And I will start, number one, with macroeconomic and financial stability. And in a way, you know, how can we revive the uh, Pittsburgh G20 uh, summit, spirit at least? Uh, something that would have been very useful going back to 2008 uh, is the idea of what I would call a global financial contagion model. So in other words, how can we anticipate domino effects uh, across many counterparties, countries, regions of the world, right? Um, some work has been done already at a country level, usually at the request of a central bank. I'll just name Brazil as an example. You could argue that in the EU, EMIR, which is the European Market Infrastructure Regulation Framework, uh, would have most of the data to perform such an exercise, but we need to actually do it and then do it globally. I think that, that would be very important. More generally, I think it would be very useful to have what I would call a extreme risk measure of the entire world economy. Uh, across many dimensions, not just market and credit risk, but also climate change, cybersecurity, oper operational risk, you, you name it. Nothing new in a sense. We know we can reuse the models and the stress tests that are, are already applied to institutions deemed too big to fail. Uh, and once you have what's called in the jargon of, of the regulators a stress value at risk, for the entire financial system, you should have the ability to essentially slice and dice uh, amongst all institutions and risk factors so that you can ac attribute risk uh, where it belongs. Uh, I think that would be uh, very useful. Of, of course, that will require us to stress test all financial institutions, not just, you know, too big to fail, and that includes shadow banking, that includes sovereign states themselves, and, and that includes fintech, and you know, uh, we shouldn't be taken by surprise when um, a cryptocurrency exchange collapses, right? I mean, there's something that doesn't work here. And, and so to conclude on, on this first point, having a common risk framework help us find common interest, which I think is the key to international goodwill, not treaties, not really rules, not really pressure, uh, you name it. So, to me, common interest uh, can change the balance of power uh, very little else. else. Uh, so, number two in my wish list, and it's quite different, but it's related, equality of opportunity uh, for companies, countries, and, of course, uh, individuals. I go much deeper uh, on these issues in my latest book, uh, le capitaliste contre les inégalités, but here is a few important points. Uh, first, and I'm talking about companies first, uh, did you know that 1% of companies control 98% of the patents that are actually useful? Uh, it's, it's a staggering number. And so if you look, for instance, at the fascinating example of generic drugs in the United States, uh, it started 40 years ago, Today, 90% of, um, of prescriptions are, are done on the basis of uh, generic drugs. So you may say, well, it's a great success, right? Unfortunately, cost of prescription medicines have continued to increase overall, and, and you could argue that innovation has been deterred by essentially price gouging. Uh, what happened? Well, patents were too much abused. Uh, so this is, to me, a perfect example of excessive rent, and that amounts, in a sense, to what we call in the book, to private taxis, especially if you look at the net effect, right? Because wh what you see is a rent going from all of us to, say, the top 1% of people, right? So that's highly regressive, uh, and that number exceeds the tax redistribution from the top 1% to the rest of the, uh, of the population. So net-net, you have a fairly regressive 
uh, impact. Equity is also about fighting externalities, first of all, climate change. And the question is, you know, do you do it according to, say, Nobel Prize winner William Nordhaus by creating a, a club structure with penalties uh, for countries outside the club so we can meet our carbon emission goals much faster than today? Or should we create a compensation scheme for poor countries like uh, the fund proposed by the COP27 just two weeks ago. Uh, in fact, I think we should do both because then you can provide fairness to the system, but at the same time, uh, without perturbing the price signal too much. Uh, I think that's important. And then a final word about equality of opportunity for individuals this time. Uh, the key to me is optimize human capital over the entire life. Uh, of people, and that is tricky for governments because they need to do more long-term planning, right? Always something difficult for governments. So they need to beef up their ability to monitor the performance of public policies better, uh, both in terms of return on investment, and so you can prioritize what you're doing, uh, but also in terms of fairness of the welfare uh, system. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I take your... Uh, your message uh, as concentrating on maybe uh, let's continue to have a G20, a financial stability board, and all that goes with it continuing to function. And it, it would be part of your message on maintain rules at a global level. And uh, let's not destroy what exists and still exists at the moment we are speaking, even if it is not perfect. And I take your point on fairness for firms, fairness for individuals as a very important message. Oh.